So I, when I was speaking with, with police officers and, and, and others, I, I often saw as well that there was a desire to have the latest in, in these uh, military equipment or military style equipment It included drones, armored vehicles, um, you know, advanced weaponry, other things. On the other hand, we also see that certain bad actors get their hands on pretty advanced military equipment that they shouldn't either. Uh, I, I went toward a Department of Justice facility where they showed me every style of weapon that you would think uh, people should not be able to get their, <coughs> excuse me, their hands on, including uh, RPGs, uh, automatic weapons, body armor, that sort of thing. Should this 1033 policy by the Department of Defense um, be revised in a particular way? Uh, you said there should be more oversight, but should there be some curtailment of, of the program itself or, or does it need to just be tailored to modern um, sensibilities a little, more, a little bit more than it is? I would argue it needs to be significantly curtailed. Um, we or helped organize a letter of former law enforcement officials that said that this is not equipment that they need, particularly this most militaristic equipment to accomplish their jobs. There might be in very rare instances that they need to use this and that's where we would urge that you should be having uh, local civilian authorities approving the use of these systems. But there is actually a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act in the Senate that would curtail what equipment can be used. Unfortunately, an amendment that was going to limit this program even more um, got the majority of votes, but not enough to for the threshold <laughs> uh, necessary. Um, so I think that, especially when we're seeing the kinds of abuses that we're seeing right now, and that we need to have significant reform, it's an appropriate time to pause this program and make sure that it is achieving the goals that it should be. And I think right now we're just seeing that it's, it's really making our communities more unsafe. Thanks. Uh, David, let me uh, continue on the subject that you were bringing up about the warrior culture that you, that you were discussing. Um, and, um, and it was helpful to hear your, the, what, what you shared about how much has been borrowed from the military. Um, one thing I've often wondered is whether the, the training and, and tactics and, and warrior culture mentality from the military fit in, in, in local policing situations. Uh, and in particular, you know, what officers often see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, regarding mental illness and substance abuse. Um, does, does that kind of approach and, and training fit with de-escalation strategies and other things that are coming up in, in, uh, in discussions for reform? Or is there an inherent tension between those two modes of policing? I think there's a inherent tension and a large inherent tension. Um, if police officers are thinking of everybody that they meet as somebody that they might need to kill, uh, that's not congenial to the kinds of interaction that the community policing movement emphasized uh, and tried to encourage. Let me follow up with that. I mean, what, what, what do you think about um, um, the training and the type of tactics that have been incorporated into, into the, the modern police force uh, with respect to use of force policies? You know, and, 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 and particularly use of lethal force, because if, if, if that standard relates to whether an officer reasonably believes that their life or the life of someone else is in danger, does a military style training push someone's perspective about what is a reasonable expectation versus a, a, a different type of training model? Um, well, I mean, let, let me throw it over to you. I mean, what, how, how do you see the interplay between use of force policies and, and this militarization trend? Well, I think uh, there, are, there are two points of intersection here. One is uh, just the general mindset that if you're encouraging police officers to see themselves as warriors, and, and that's the term that you use to describe how police officers should think of themselves, that, that's, that's not consistent with the kind of policing that American communities want and that will help them. Um, I also think though that there are particular tactics um, that 
police officers are taught um, that are consistent with a warrior approach, that are not consistent with de-escalation, and that are responsible for uh, a fair bit of uh, the police violence that we see in this country. So um, one problem that we always have when we compare police forces in the United States with police forces overseas, and we notice that police forces overseas kill many, many fewer civilians per capita than American police forces. One problem with that comparison is that we have so many more guns in the United States. And uh, so it is true that American police officers face a more dangerous environment um, than police officers overseas because of the presence of guns. But America, but about 15% of the thousand or so people who are killed every year by the police are people who the police know are not armed with a gun, who the police know are armed, are unarmed or um, have only a knife. And police officers overseas encounter people with knives a lot, just as often as police officers in the United States do. Um, and police officers overseas in, encounter people with knives who are in mental health distress as often as people, as police officers in the United States do. And they don't kill those people. Um, uh, there, there are very few deaths um, uh, 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 overseas when police encounter people who are threatening and, ha and have a knife. In the United States, about 150 people who fall into this category are killed by the police every year. And that's partly um, because of the way the police are trained. Lots of police in the United States are trained in something called the 21-foot rule. The, 21, the idea of the 21-foot rule is that once somebody with a knife gets within 21 feet of you, you're not going to have time to draw your weapon and shoot them before they come and kill you with their knife. So that encourages police officers to believe that if somebody with a knife comes within 21 feet of them, they need to shoot that person. So there is zero evidence to support this rule. It was, <laughs> there's never been any evidence to support it. And yet police officers in the United States continue to be trained uh, in, the 21, uh, in the 21 foot rule. And they're not trained um, in, in the techniques of de-escalation that officers um, in the United Kingdom, in continental Europe are routinely trained in um, that lead to um, outcomes in these cases that aren't deadly. Mandy, let me follow up on that last point that David mentioned uh, with, with respect to policing overseas and in particular the U.S.'s own guidance toward, toward uh, other countries with, in terms of policing. As, as I understand it, there's been an emphasis on establishing community policing, uh, but uh, you know, when, when the U.S. speaks outwardly to, to other countries, but perhaps that, as, as the both of you have been mentioning, that, that hasn't been followed as much here. What is it about the perspective of, of policing overseas that, that we might be able to learn from or, or pick up on uh, in, in, in terms of addressing this issue now? Yeah, so I think something to keep in mind, particularly around counterterrorism, is that we've had a, an understanding that the legitimacy of a government is really important to building the trust of the people and to having security. And one of the reasons that we have this emphasis on the need for human rights and community policing is that's how you build trust with the community and so that you're able to appropriately address real dangers, but so that you aren't having an approach that continues to feed distrust, corruption, and illegitimacy. Now, we're certainly not perfect <laughs> in training that in other countries either, and there's a lot of evidence, but I think that we understand Stand a little bit better why it's essential that we make sure that we get it right and that we aren't, you know, helping to further for abuses that increase the likelihood that people will join terrorist groups that delegitimize the government, that delegitimize rule of law, and that all of these forces have to work together. So if I hear the both of you, they're uh, uh, both of you seem to have taken the opinion that this militarization trend is is counterproductive and 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 the source of what many consider to be the problems that are happening with with policing and their interaction with, in particular, the African American community, but many communities of of, of color. 
what, uh, Mandy, let me ask you first, what do you see as pres prescriptive ways of reversing that trend or, or, or starting to uh, undo some of this, um, some of this uh, uh, sort of forceful presence by the police in, in the communities? Yeah, and I would recommend to people, my colleagues at the Constitution Project um, organized a, a task force on demilitarizing the police that is a more robust report that goes into these many issues. But a couple of the recommendations that they had is one, you know, that we need to have more accounting for how this equipment is used, that we need to have training that's focused on police as guardian rather than as a warrior, that we need to have civilian approval for the use of this equipment in the 1033 program, and that you know, for certain kind of counterterrorism uh, missions, even if you want to use some of the tactics of the military, have law enforcement officers being the like one law enforcement officer, you know, be the one to train other law enforcement officers so that they have an understanding of the Constitution and the respect that we need to show our fellow citizens. David, same question for you. What what are some things you would propose to undo some of these trends toward militarization? Well, I agree with Mandy that we need to cut back on the 1033 program. Um, I think uh, SWAT teams um, should be shrunk and shared regionally, um, as opposed to having every little department have its own SWAT team. I think we need to keep better statistics about police use of force. Um, I think um, we need to um, make greater use of after action reviews of police shootings. Um, we, the law enforcement uh, needs to do what the military does, what aviation does, um, what the CDC does, what lots of industries do, which is whenever there is a shooting, figure out what, were, what contributed to that shooting, what could have been done uh, to prevent it. Um, and I think we need to um, recommit to the, the agenda of the community policing movement um, and uh, to deepen and broaden that agenda um, because although community policing um, was a great idea and the community policing movement did a lot of good, um, it didn't go far enough in many ways. With respect to the SWAT units, um... And, and I understand part of it was because the costs were diminished in order to be able to stand up these SWAT units in, in many different areas. How, how would you, David, um, how would you purpose SWAT in, in, in this sort of reimagined way of looking at a, a less militarized police force? Uh, what, what purpose would they serve uh, in, uh, rather than you know, I mean, let me ask, let me start with this. How often are they called out, um, as, as, as far as you understand, relative to, um, are, are they a regular presence for, for the use of warrants, for example, or, 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 or do they use, are they used more in a more specialized way as, as they were intended? They're uh, used way too routinely uh, for executing drug warrants. Um, and uh, that, that was um, the original sin of the SWAT program, was, uh, was when the program, uh, m when SWAT teams moved from units that were aimed at hostage situations and bomb threats to being used um, uh, for the war on drugs. And I, I should say, by the way, that um, uh, in some ways, the, the, the militarization of policing um, can be traced to uh, the very language of the war on drugs. Um, when, when you call, when, 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 you, when we named that problem a war, um, when we called for it to be treated as a war, we were laying the groundwork for introducing the routine use of military equipment, military tactics, and a military mindset. And all of that uh, the, the mindset, the tactics, and the equipment has been used disproportionately in, in minority communities. And I, I would also note, I, I think I read an article uh, or about something that happened a few months back uh, where a, uh, a SWAT unit in South Florida resigned en masse uh, because of the pressure they were feeling with, with not being supported enough um, and so let me ask you this, Mandy, how, 
how would you convey some of these um, proposed reforms in a way that would be palatable or, or reach across to, to law enforcement officers who feel in some ways besieged by, by all the criticism that's going on? What, how, you know, what, what kind of, if you put your diplomatic hat on, what kind of uh, messaging and, and content would you, would you use to try to bring them, bring them across to, uh, to what you believe? So there is a part of me that also thinks that we do need to make sure that they're being held accountable. It's important to reach them, but I think that they've had an oversized voice in our policies. And I, I do just want to make, uh, premise it on that. But what I would say is that you are a public servant and you want to protect your community and the best, but the way that the department is, acting out, the impunity there is for those who abuse citizens is undermining the legitimacy of law enforcement and the ability for you to accomplish your mission. And that you, I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day is that I think most people are police officers because they do want to protect their fellow communities and it is a public service mission. But when that you're not, when the public doesn't feel served, you need to re-examine how you're acting and see what changes can be made. David, what, what, how about you? How would you um, try to approach police departments and, um, and try to get people to understand the need for a, a, a reform that emphasizes militarization less and, 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 and points them back into a different direction? Well, I agree with Mandy that we need to be doing two things. Uh, on the one hand, we need to be showing police departments a better way. Um, and, and that means recommitting ourselves to the agenda of community policing and um, pursuing that agenda in ways that are even more rigorous and thoroughgoing uh, than what was done in the 1980s and 1990s. But I think that uh, accountability it, it, it is important, um, partly um, because uh, there's no way to pursue an agenda of community policing um, without um, uh, the prospect of enlisting the community um, and building community trust. And we, we can't begin to build community trust um, without holding police uh, departments accountable. And um, it, it's, um, I mean, uh, public confidence in the police today is uh, the lowest that it's been in decades. Um, and there, you can't go to uh, communities, particularly poor and minority communities now and say, oh, we're going back to, to community policing. Come work with the police to help to deliver community safety. That's just not gonna work at this point without um, uh, steps taken to make clear to communities um, that the police are going to be held accountable, not just for criminal violations, um, but for um, misconduct um, and um, errors, as well as uh, criminal wrongdoing. And if I can, I'd just like to plug an investigation by my colleague, Jason Palladino, that he did um, while part of the Berkeley Reporting Project on the number of cops who have been convicted of crimes and just kind of are able to go from police department to police department and how that information was not made available to the public. So I think it's just one of many areas where we need to just make sure that we have accountability for the police like we would for any other public official. And, and do you, uh, let me follow up, Mandy, would you uh, encourage more transparency in those types of records being available to the public? Or, or what, what in particular would you find instrumental in changing about, about that obscurity right now? Yeah, I would encourage more transparency, you know, if not naming the individual officers, at least having a sense of the scope of the issue. Um, and just Again, I think that goes back to building the same trust. This is a law enforcement body. They should be following the laws. And if they're convicted criminals, we need to see real evidence that they have made reforms so that they are good custodians of rule of law. Uh, David, one of, one of the topics in, um, in your books relates to police unions uh, and the role that they have played uh, in uh, um, 
in you know on the one hand also trying to safeguard the the rights and and um and benefits of of this very difficult job but on the other hand uh perhaps being um standing in a way that uh doesn't seem consistent with with the reform efforts that are happening today. Can you speak to um, some of these institutional bodies and and what role they're playing uh, in, in the militarization of police and and how um, how that might be changed if 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 you thought it was necessary to change it? Yeah. So uh, it, police unions, unfortunately, uh, have not uh, been significant drivers of a meaningful reform of policing in the United States over the last several decades. More often, uh, they've been obstacles to reform. Um, the union in um, uh, Minneapolis is a um, particularly um, discouraging example of that. Um, uh, the mayor of Minneapolis uh, a year ago banned um, warrior training uh, for uh, officers in the Minneapolis Police Department, and the police union responded by offering to fund that kind of training for any officers who were interested in receiving it. Um, police unions um, in the United States um, have um, generally um, not taken uh, progressive approaches to dealing with uh, issues of the, uh, of the use of force. Um, and um, they haven't uh, uh, represented the views uh, of all of their members um, uh, uh, and the breadth of opinion on these issues. Um, police unions uh, often uh, tend to represent the views of older officers, of male officers, and of white officers more than they do of younger officers of female officers and, and minority officers. Um, there are uh, uh, signs that that might be, may be changing in some cases, and I think it would, would be good. Uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that it will, it will change. Um, one of the reasons that police unions um, have, have been uh, an obstacle and not a help in police reform is um, that that's the, the role that they, they were assigned to. Um, police officers tend to think that nobody listens to them, and they're often right. Um, we don't take enough account of the views of rank and file officers in trying uh, to chart uh, a better future for policing. Um, and um, uh, by statute, in most parts of the United States, police unions can't participate in discussions uh, about tactics and philosophies uh, and management philosophies, their job is to protect uh, their um, members um, when the members face disciplinary proceedings and to represent their members in collective bargaining discussions. Um, and, and they've doubled down on that. Um, so uh, I, 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 um, I, I, it, it is encouraging to me uh, that police unions in some parts of the country um, have become more willing to speak out against uh, some of the worst examples of uh, police uses of force that we've seen over the last several months. Um, and um, that, that's something that we should encourage. Let me open up to questions from the, from the audience. Um, many uh, great questions have already been coming in. And I'll start with... Uh, President of Pacific Council, Jerry Green's question, is the situation the same in sheriff departments with elected leadership and police departments with appointed leadership? In other words, do, can one discern whether the militarization trend uh, happens more in, 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 in the way that the leadership has been established, or, you know, either by sheriff or, or, or an appointed police chief? David, I'll, I'll ask you. I, I think that uh, it, it's a problem both in sheriff's departments um, and in um, uh, police departments. And you, um, you, you might, uh, it, it's hard to um, compare sheriff's uh, departments with police departments, not be, because they differ not just in that sheriffs are generally elected and police chiefs are generally appointed, but also in that sheriff's offices uh, generally serve rural 
and unincorporated uh, parts of a county, um, whereas police departments serve more urban parts uh, of the county. So um, uh, they're, they're, they, they, they're different kinds of animals for that reason. Um, but uh, there, have, there are, um, it, it would be wonderful if we could say that we don't see these problems in sheriff's departments because sheriff's departments have to worry about what the, the voters will say, um, but that's not true. There, have been, there are lots of sheriff's departments that have bad histories of violence. Mandy, let me ask you this question from, from the audience. Uh, what is your view about the benefits of establishing national standards? Uh, is there evidence that the, the United Nations Human Rights Council has called for reform, has influenced police departments? I, I would defer to David on the last part of that question, but um, I think it can be beneficial, but I think when we're talking about putting together those standards, that's where we need to be embedding the community policing kinds of standards. So who all is at the table for developing those standards? Are we making sure that we're hearing from rank and file law enforcement who serve different kinds of communities? Are we hearing from community leaders as well? Um, and I think is if that's an inclusive process, then I think that can be a really effective tool. Um, but I look forward to David's thoughts on this too. So and David, not, let me say this also, you know, obviously with the, with the campaign going on, there's uh, quite a bit of discussion about the extent to which the federal government can play a role in in what is usually quintessentially a very local activity. Um, in your view, you know, can can there be a baseline national set of standards that could apply throughout the country and then be built from you know with uh, with local with local practices? Yeah, I'm not aware of, of any evidence that the UN uh, Human Rights Council has had an influence on uh, US police departments. But I definitely think that there is uh, an imp a large and important role for national standards with regard uh, to all aspects of policing, including the use of force. And in fact, I think we were beginning to see the development of national standards um, during the Obama administration and they came through um, the um, uh, structural reform actions uh, that the Department of Justice is authorized to bring against local police departments uh, that engage in a pattern or practice of constitutional violations. So um, for a couple of decades now, the Department of Justice has had the authority to seek uh, court orders um, um, overseeing reform of those departments. And um, by threatening that kind of court action has been able to um, uh, reach agreement with many police departments without even the need to file a court action. Um, the, the Trump administration stopped uh, those uh, um, proceedings when, when it took over. And one of the reasons that was unfortunate was that uh, these um, actions by the Department of Justice had begun to develop a, 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 a fairly rich set of um, best practices and standards um, for the use of force, for including the community, um, for effective uh, disciplinary action, for um, tracking problem officers. Um, and um, we, we by uh, abandoning that, uh, that, that lever of reform, the Trump administration uh, abandoned uh, the, 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 the best um, and most effective um, avenue uh, that uh, we had developed for pursuing national standards for policing. Um. Another question from the audience that uh, police departments love to use the term partnership with communities. Uh, should we tell them that we will not use that term until their standards are aligned with building community trust? This goes back to the discussion you were both were having that this is not going to be an easy slip of the switch uh, in order to start to rebuild the trust in the community. So, uh, you know, how, how, how do police departments begin the process of rebuilding that trust? 
Oh, go ahead, David. Well, I would, I would, I wouldn't wait until police departments uh, uh, align their standards with what we think that they should be. I, 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 I think that um, th this should be something that um, uh, communities are pushing for and um, taking into their own, own hands um, without waiting for the police uh, to initiate it. On the other hand, I do think that the police uh, should be uh, encouraged and invited to be part of the process. So when I said before that um, the community policing movement uh, hadn't gone far enough, this was part of what I had in mind, that the, uh, the community policing was uh, always described as the police partnering with the community. Um, but um, the community um, was never well-defined and partnering was never well defined. And as a result, too many people weren't considered part of the community that needed to be brought into community policing. And um, I think it is true that too often partnering uh, with the community um, meant uh, public relations, that the police would decide what needed to be done um, and then try to sell the public on it. Um, that's not what partnering should mean. Uh, I agree. Um, Mandy, here's a question that's on, on everyone's minds. Can you talk about the concept of defunding the police and what that means? Sure. So, um, despite its nomaker, <laughs> it's not actually saying, you know, get rid of your police department, but saying that we need to be shifting those, a, a lot of those funds to other community needs that are better at addressing addressing what actually causes crime. So let's not address mental illness through the police. Let's not address poverty through the police. Let's fund the social service agencies that are best equipped to do that. Let me follow up on that because I've, I've thought about this for some time now, but uh, if, if funds were diverted to other specialists, shall we say, that might be better equipped to handle things like mental health and other issues, it's not always clear when, uh, when, let's say, a mental health crisis counselor would be better served in a, in a situation versus uh, a police officer if it, if it turns violent. Uh, how, you know, how, how would that work in, in the view of, of, of each of you in terms of if you're gonna repurpose the resources, but there are certain situations where public safety is called for, how, how might that work in, in, a, in, in a different sense than, than what's happening now? Go ahead, David, I'll, I'll ask you that. Well, I think it's a mistake to focus on resources as opposed to functions and, who, and how functions are being carried out. Um, uh, I don't think we have good examples of police departments that have uh, become better or even less harmful because of resources being taken away from them. We, and we actually have a lot of experience with taking resources away from police departments because a lot of that happened um, in the first decade of the 21st century because of budget crises. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if you if you look at a city like Vallejo, for example, this is an extreme example, but I think it's a telling one. This is a city that did defund its police department in the first decade of the 21st century um, because of uh, budget pressures um, and um, violent encounters between the police and citizens didn't go down. They went up um, because police officers were stressed and stretched. Um, and because when um, police departments are told that they have to trim their budgets, community policing efforts are usually the first to go. Um, the, the best example we have, I think, of a police department being abolished um, and um, police violence going down is Camden, New Jersey. Um, but that's, that, that's, a, that's a story of a police department being disbanded and replaced with a new department 
that actually was, had more funding and more resources than the old department. And I, I think that there's, um, there is overlap between the agenda of uh, advocates who call for defunding the police and the older agenda of community policing. And it's precisely in the area that Mandy was talking about, figuring out what kinds of, uh, of um, functions are better served by somebody other than the police, or at least better served by somebody other than an armed uniform police officer. And that can include mental health response, it could include um, homeless services, it probably includes uh, school security, it may include traffic enforcement. There are a variety of activities that we can think about shifting away out of a police department or at least at, away from armed uniformed officers. Um, and I, that, that's, a, that's an area of overlap between the community because that's, that was never, those were never priority. That, that was, it was never part of community policing that the police should be doing all that. Um, on the other hand, it was a part of community policing that the police should be engaging more with people in the community, that we should be building thicker ties between the police and the community, and that, and that, and that those ties require time uh, and uh, connections. Um, and uh, I, um, I think that a lot of advocates today have come to the conclusion uh, that that's a blind alley that uh, we, the, the, we don't want to have more contact between the police and the public. We want to have less contact between the police and the public. Um, and I, I, I think th there are, it's a reasonable position for people to take. I think it's wrong um, because I think we've been down that road. I think that that was um, part of um, what police, some police departments did in the early 1960s was precisely to pull, this is what, this was the reform agenda of the Los Angeles Police Department in the early 1960s. Shrink the number of officers, uh, uh, restrict the, the, the number of encounters between police and officers. Um, and that, that was a disaster. That's part of what got the, made the Los Angeles Police Department such a, uh, such a, um, uh, a bad, ineffective, violent department. Um, so, my, my own view is uh, that we should be redoubling our commitment uh, to community policing. And I do think that that overlaps in some ways with the agenda of uh, the defund uh, uh, reformers. But I think we need to acknowledge that there's some tension uh, between the community policing agenda and the defund agenda. I've been waiting to combine these next two questions um, because it's a, it's a big topic. Um, the first one from an audience is how does, how does that, and I assume that means, how does the militarization trend explain why more black citizens are killed than white citizens? And another uh, attendee has asked, what if any efforts are urban police departments uh, becoming culturally competent? Uh, and, um, I want to combine those for the for the moment uh, because uh, and, and just ask it in, in a bit of a broader sense. What is the role that um, that race and, and implicit bias and racism is playing with uh, with the militarization trend, um, especially with the warrior culture of if 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 officers are being trained to um, perceive people in in the way of uh, if you have a knife 26 feet away, I'm going, I need to kill you. Uh, how does racism play a role in, 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 the, in those, in, in the development or in, in that kind of training and mindset that has, uh, as you say, David, started to permeate the police forces? Oh, uh, this is going to be, you to first. Be, Mandy, what, what is, what is your sense of this first? So, I think one of the major aspects of militarization is really seeing citizens as other or as an enemy, that it's an us versus them kind of perspective. And then when you add yeah, this training and this equipment that you're pouring gasoline on what's already a very unhealthy dynamic, um, that I think there are certain 
ways that just we, again, as Stephen mentioned, you know, the war on drugs, all of these kinds of things lead in which communities we, you know, wage that war on. You know, it's important to keep in mind that when, with the opioid crisis, that suddenly we had a lot more empathy for people and we saw the need for treatment and that there could be other solutions here that that kind of generosity was not given to for the crack epidemic. So those are some of the things that feed onto each other, but I'm looking forward to David's answer. So I think that all of these aspects of militarization get trained on um, minority communities um, and um, members of those communities more than they do on wealthier communities or on white communities. Um, that's true of SWAT teams, which get used much more often in minority neighborhoods. It's true of uh, the use of militarized equipment. And it's true of uh, the warrior mentality, which um, is ad ad adopted uh, in a much more thoroughgoing way um, by departments and officers who serve low-income and minority communities. On the issue of cultural competence, um, there's lots uh, that can be done, um, but I, I want to underscore one particular um, part of the reform agenda that I think often gets slighted, which is diversifying the ranks of police officers. Um, and um, the, the, in a way, um, uh, so the, the first thing to say is that we, we've made a lot of progress diversifying policing. Policing in the, in the late 1960s was almost uniformly male, almost uniformly white, um, and uh, rapidly homophobic. Um, and we, there are many more minority officers today, more women officers, uh, more openly gay and transgender officers. And that's, that's been, and I don't think any change in policing has done as much good um, as that change. Nonetheless, it's an incomplete transformation. And part of the reason why it's an incomplete transformation is that uh, the nation's commitment to affirmative action in general and to diversifying police departments in particular tended to flag. Um, and um, there are people on the right who are uncomfortable with race conscious remedies uh, and gender conscious remedies, which, which are disproportionately responsible for the progress we've made in diversifying police departments. And then there are people on the left who are worried about tokenism. They, and <laughs> they wanna stress that diversifying police departments isn't a panacea, which is absolutely true, but there are no panaceas with regard to police reform. And um, there is lots of evidence uh, that when you diversify departments, you open up uh, conversations inside that department to new points of view. You make it easier, although certainly not inevitable, that uh, uh, meaningful bridges will be built uh, to the community. Um, and uh, you create space um, for all kinds of other reforms. Um, that are harder to achieve when you have a, um, uh, a monolithic police department. Having said that, um, there is a chicken and egg problem here. It's tough to recruit minority officers um, when uh, people in minority communities view the police as an occupying army. Right. Uh, I think we may have time for one or two more questions at the most, and so let me pick this one. Uh, an audience member writes, can you speak to the LA Police Foundation and the power of corporate and private funding in fueling police militarization? Mandy, I don't know if you, do you, do you know anything about the LA Police I was, Foundation? As an outsider from DC, I feel like it's not appropriate for me to comment then. <laughs> Let me ask David then. Uh, I can't really speak to that. Okay, all right. Well, then let, let, me, let me ask this question. Uh, an anonymous attendee writes, who can local taxpayers complain to if a police department is using their money to buy a needless armored vehicle? Depends where they are. Certain, you know, the city council, and uh, if, uh, you know, if they're in a city that has a, a civilian police commission like Los Angeles, uh, the police commission. 
Uh, actually, as a follow-up, what, what are your views, either of you, about civilian police commissions? Uh, what, what role can they play? Is that, is that something that cities should strive to have in every community, or is it, uh, is it more helpful in a, in, a, in a more urban context? What, how, what role can the civilian police commissions serve in, in these discussions we're having now? Mandy, do you, let, let me ask you, uh, do you, do you what, what is your sense of the uh, role of a civilian police commission? Oh, I, I'll defer to David on this one, actually. I think it, I think it's context specific. I think it depends uh, because I think that um, uh, every, every civilian uh, police commission is configured in different ways. Um, and the politics around these commissions uh, can vary greatly. So um, what, what's important is that there be a meaningful partnership uh, between the police and other parts of the community. So it, 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 you don't want a commission that is cowed by the police and that rubber stamps uh, everything that the police uh, say they want to do. Um, you want a, a, a commission uh, that will listen to the police um, and that will work with the police, but will ensure that important decisions about how community safety is provided are not made by the police, but by the entire community. Okay. I think I am, I am able to fit in one final question. This is from a member, Jack Riley, who writes, as someone who evaluated the 1033 program, I think the session could use a little more context on the program. Um, I'm not sure what context in particular Jack is referring to, but Mandy, can you shed a little more light on, on, on the 1033 program and, and, um, uh, and, and you know, again, why, why you think it, it, it needs a little curtailment or, 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 or changes to it? Sure. Um, so, I, you know, I'll reiterate that the Government Accountability Office investigation found that there was, you know, very little oversight over who was receiving this equipment, you know, they were a fake police department with a <laughs> fake address and were able to get about a million dollars worth of equipment uh, without any kind of meaningful oversight. And I, one of the, you know, major debates is what excess DOD equipment, uh, Department of Defense equipment should be going to police forces. There are, and we also have concerns that it encourages waste too, that if you know that you can kind of give this to someone else down the line, that that creates additional problems. But the initial support for the 1033 program, as David mentioned, was you know concerns around the war on drugs and the concerns around excess guns that were in, being, that criminals had, where it seemed like criminals had pretty militaristic weapons as well that they were able to build. So that was some of the context for why there was initial support for the program. Great, so I, I think we are running out of time uh, and I want to thank David and Mandy for a, a really enlightening conversation. It's been a pleasure speaking with the both of you and, uh, and as we said at the top of the program, this is, uh, this is a very timely uh, and compelling discussion that we're having. Uh, in the midst of, of all the things that we're seeing with, with protests, with, with shootings, and, uh, and with, um, with our elections. So I want to thank the both of you for participating in this discussion and, and enlightening us on, on all that you know about the, the militarization of, of law enforcement. Thank you both very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for including me too.